Welcome back to another episode of Not Financial Advice. I'll ask you to like the video and if you haven't already subscribed to the channel. So as you saw by the headline on Friday, I put across uh, $2,553 of investments into the market. And so we're going to do a recap of what I bought and why I bought it. Um, if we can see here, um, this week I went with an approach of buying all ETFs and mutual funds. So I've purchased um, some Vanguard some Vanguard funds you can see here. Um, firstly, so I did $250 across the board for the most part. Uh, so I bought Vanguard Financials ETF. So this is gonna be banks as well as some other types of businesses. You know, the concept on so the concept on wanting to buy into some ETFs at this point, uh, my portfolio is closing in on $60,000, which is a lot of money to me, more money than I've ever had in my life. And, um, you know, although I have seen some really big drawdowns in 2022, um, handled those just fine, I am wanting to sort of cement some of my gains and my contributions into this portfolio um, to make sure that I'm staying at a at a given level so there's a concept which you know i really do buy into but put too much emphasis on initially and the concept is that you never lose money in the market unless you sell and that is true um, as long as your security doesn't go to zero at the same time suffering um suffering large on realized losses if a stock goes down 50 percent it has to gain a hundred percent to go back to even and so when we're talking about volatility and on realized losses sure you're not necessarily losing money um, but when you have large on realized losses um, the impact of compound interest can't take effect and so you have to be at a certain baseline you have to be having positive returns um, throughout the years of your investing journey, every year won't be positive. Um, some years will be negative, but that's when you hold your nose, keep on buying, reinvest these dividends. And so this was the concept, not only a little bit of an update on my journey in investing, but also sort of a note on my decision to deploy um, $2,500 $33 into the market through funds. So let's talk about these real quick. First one is, again, uh, VFH. It's a bank ETF. And so the concept with this is a few fold. Um, number one, banks are in the business of money. So they take our deposits, they give us small returns on, uh, on our savings accounts, but they take our money and they invest it. And they're in the they're in the business of handling and making money. Um, you know, I have to admit, Buffett has a has a, a proclivity for bank stocks, and so it's something that caught my eye. But um, you don't hear of too many uh, presidents of uh, of local banks or national bank CEOs who aren't doing well, and so there's a few elements on this, you know, you don't want to necessarily look at macroeconomics or try to time the market cycles. And so I'm, I'm a little bit fuzzy on when historically has been the best time to be investing into bank stocks. But the concept here is that, um, you know, banks, um, banks can in higher interest rate environments, banks are charging interest on loans and so you know banks um are pretty at at this point after the debacle um 10 years ago banks are pretty steady um pretty safe pretty regulated to an extent um, and they can make some of that money on the spread of interest rates when they make loans to customers so i like having exposure to banks and that's why i uh increase my holding in vfh a lot of these are a little bit more straightforward, so we'll just pile through them. So I also bought $250 of Vanguard VPU, which is a utilities ETF. And so um, 
I'm a stock market investor. I own individual stocks. I own uh, funds as well. I do not own real estate. I do not own alternative asset classes. I do not own commodities. I own stocks. And that also means that I don't own bonds. So I'm younger. Um, I can handle the volatility. Uh, sometimes the concept is greater risk, greater reward. At the same time, um, looking at you know my holdings with the majority of them being in individual stocks, it's important to um, to have some stocks that will move in the opposite direction of the market. And so the utility sector is only in correlation with the market 50% of the time. So there have been times in the past when the market goes down that utility stocks goes up. And so the concept is, is that they are bond-like in nature. Um, they are you know, equities, they're stocks. They pay dividends, they're regulated. Similar to the banks, the banks also pay a nice dividend. Um, but when it comes to VPU, the concept is, you know, even in a recession, the vast majority of people are able to and prioritize paying their light and water bill. And so I'm going to own those businesses. Um, looking down the list here, I did make some investments into XAR. No, I did not do this. Uh, explicitly because of the tragic situation that's going on overseas. Um, I have had a position in um, XAR, which is, again, um, Spiders, S&P, um, Aerospace and Defense ETF. This one's interesting. Um, it holds defense stocks, um, aerospace and defense stocks, war stocks, across both the large, mid, and small cap space. And so historically, this form has outperformed, outperformed some of the larger uh, cap war stock funds. So this is a, another sector along with utilities that is considered uh, one of the three defensive, one of the four defensive sectors in the S&P 500. And so although I'm an investor and I like stocks um, and I stay 100% invested, I do have some bearish proclivities. Um, and so owning these sectors that are uh, by nature defensive is something that I like. Defense stocks, um, you know, these are stocks that shouldn't necessarily be looked too different than than treasury notes or bills or bonds. Um, the US federal government will always spend on war. So a lot of these revenues are essentially guaranteed. Um, they'll either stay at a certain level or they can go up. Uh, generally, these larger defense companies also pay a nice dividend. They're stable, mature businesses, um, mon monopolistic in the sense that uh, they're essentially an extension, if not a part of the U.S. federal government. So we increased our position in XAR uh, yesterday. Going down the list, I did buy into uh, Charles Schwab's SCHY which is an international um, high dividend yield ETF. Most of these are from developed countries, although not all of them. Um, but these are going to be companies, um, you know, Canadian bank stocks, um, European consumer stocks, European medical stocks, um, some industrials from throughout the world. There's some small exposure to China, very small. Um, but international dividend stocks. Um, I'm also, on top of being a, a little bit of a bear, I'm also a bit of a contrarian when it comes to investing. And so we're going to see in a second, but there have been whole decades when uh, U.S. stock returns were flat, but international stocks outperformed. And so because I have less of an ability to understand um, international stocks, I can understand Pepsi. I understand Pepsi stock. I don't necessarily understand businesses from around the world, but I still want that exposure. So what I do is I barbell it. I go half with SCHY, you know, international blue chip dividend pairs, and then half into Vanguard's VXUS, total international stock market XUS. So what I'm doing here is I'm just reducing my exposure to emerging markets because emerging markets have been emerging for 50 years. Um, but I do want to have some exposure 
to emerging markets. So I go ahead and I barbell SCHY and VXUS. So I think that explains it. And we're going to look at the returns of international stocks here together in a second. So lastly, um, the three the three of four um, dividend dividend paying stocks from a sector that is labeled as defensive. So the fourth defensive sector of the S and P five hundred is going to be consumer staples. But because I'm an American, I'm by default a consumer. That's my circle of competence. So I own a lot of individual companies within the con consumer defensive space. I don't need exposure to those um, companies via an index or an ETF because I own the individual companies, Coke, Pepsi, um, many others, many others I own, um, Coors, Coors Beer, Stock Tap, it's a defensive, uh, consumer defensive stock that I own, et cetera. Also some, uh, some beauty stocks are considered defensive as well. So I do take exposure to um, the healthcare sector because I, I don't have a strong understanding of those businesses per se. So this is going to include, you know, companies like United Healthcare, so health insurance. It'll also include uh, drug makers like Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson, um, along with pharmaceutical companies, and also likely hospital um, hospital groups or nursing home uh, type assisted living care facilities. Those are the stocks that are going to comprise. Uh, VHT. And so I did add to my position in Vanguard Healthcare ETF VHT, uh, another defensive sector within the S&P 500. So let's take a look at the rest of, so this this is 1500, I'll take a look at the next holding. So uh, Charles Schwab SEHD, this is a domestic blue chip dividend paying stock. Um, I have a small position in it. Um, some people close to me own significant significant amounts of this. This is one that's been have that has great performance. There's four criteria that this stock uh, selects its holdings by and are reconstituted uh, quarterly, but it's a passively managed index of U.S. stocks with low debt, high returns on equity. Um, consistent track record of dividend payment and dividend growth. And so those how the, that's how those stocks are weighted. There's about 105 US stocks here in SCHD. So I did add to my position on that yesterday. Now, um, we'll see here in a second, the last uh, fund that I bought. I bought a little bit of a larger amount of the last fund, but let's talk about this for a second. So this is Vanguard small cap value. And so in looking at you know, the different theories that I don't necessarily agree with things like the efficient market theory and, you know, looking at investing from more of an institutional sense. It's widely accepted that you can get a premium return for both small cap stocks as well as value stocks. And in particular, there's been a consistent about 12 and a half percent return for maybe 20 years on small cap value stocks. So this is the Vanguard uh, small cap value ETF VBR. I hold it in a Roth uh, IRA and I use this, I did 250 here. I use this to barbell um, where a large amount of my money is at, which is within my employer's uh, Roth 401k where I hold a good amount of essentially what's VTI, so the total United States stock market. So if we go back here, this is small value. And when we look at the total US stock market ETF, I added 553 here uh, yesterday after close, as this is a mutual fund. This particular fund, um, being the entire US stock market, is going to tilt towards large blend or large growth. And so I barbell domestic stocks large blend to growth to small, medium to small value. And so I barbell that and that's how I take my exposure in my retirement. All domestic stocks, keep in mind, domestic stocks, you know, um, do 20 to 40% of their revenue overseas. So I still have international exposure, but I feel the safest bet for 10, 20, 30, 40 years down the road is to keep my retirement within uh, US stocks. And so that is what I have bought in this retirement account. So that's all $2,533 of stock buys. Let's do something here. Let's take a look over on Portfolio Visualizer. I went back to 1972. 
And I want to see the years or the decades um, that stocks like VXUS or stocks like um, SCHY, I want to see during this time, which, which um, asset class has returned positive things in contrast to you know the US stock market. So I've set this up to look back all the way back. Um, it goes back to, okay, 1995. So we'll be able to see something here. Um, so since 1995, international stocks have underperformed from 95 to today. Um, but if we look here, we can see there was a period of time. So uh, in gold is the uh, S&P 500. So here was, here was the crash of uh, the tech bubble. And then we can see here during this time that for nearly a decade from 2000 up until about 2010 that we had that outperformance of international stocks. So let's look during this uh, time period. So the first, the first style of stock was um, global X US. So it's a to it's, it'd be the equivalent of the total international stock market. So since 1995, that's returned just 4.5%. Uh, over that same period of time, international value or international dividend pay or paying stocks have returned a good amount more, uh, five and three quarters, although they both pale in comparison to the returns of the U.S. stock market. Let's go back here and let's take a look at how these stocks did specifically between uh, the year, let's say, um, 2000 to 2010. If you haven't done research of this nature yourself, this is good. This is an opportunity to learn something with me that I've taught myself. So make sure to go ahead and like and subscribe to the video. I'd sure appreciate it. So looking back in that period, um, what we can see is that right here, this is fascinating. So the United States stock market had no returns for 10 years. None. No returns. Uh, but from 2000 to 2010, um, these stocks returned about uh, just under 5% on average. So I want to keep some money in the game. That's going to help me to compound no matter what the future has in store for us. And so that's a little bit of a justification of my contrarian take on holding some international equities. Um, and we'll just do a quick uh, look here. This was a search essentially for the um, index or ETF funds that I selected. I did swap out one for one that had been around for a longer period of time. What we can see here is these particular ones um, did not beat the market. They do pay uh, these funds that I bought into do pay a little bit of a higher um, dividend yield. So it should be right at about, um, if we can look here, these particular stocks that I bought, if we just look through here, these stocks pay about a 2.1% dividend yield um, to the market's 1.5. So it's a higher yield. And these dividends, when I received these dividends from these uh, ETFs, these slightly more defensive or diversified ETFs that I've bought, I'll be reinvesting those profits into growth stocks, domestic, domestic small cap stocks or growth stocks. So I'll be reinvesting uh, where I, I think that I can get a higher total return, um, but continuing to add to these. So just looking back on these um, eight different funds that I increased my exposure to with $2,500 uh, this week, you know, we can see that they underperformed pretty significantly, 8% to 12% um, between 2017 to 2023, which has been one of the strongest stretches of the U.S. Uh, growth technology stock bull market uh, of all time. But we can see that these particular funds that I bought had uh, about 66% uh, of a smaller drawdown in the 2022 bear market. And so 
that's what we see. And, um, you know, that's part of my thought process behind some of the investments that I made. But folks, this will be it for today. If you enjoyed the video, hit like and then subscribe so you can be notified the next time that I post. I will catch you on the next one.